intro music for the one, the only, Kevin Minnick from NJAdvanceMediaNJ.com. Kevin, how you doing on this Saturday, buddy? I'm doing well, Pete. How are you today? I am doing well. Thank you. I uh, will lead with this, a non-basketball question. Uh, my Our Twitter question is up. It's Saturday question is Eli Manning, a pro football Hall of Famer, yes or no, and why? What say you, Kevin Minnick? Um, I would probably say yes, and I would probably say to the point that he did win, what, two Super Bowls? Right, two-time Super That's Bowl right. MVP. He didn't just win the game, he won there MVP both times. There you go. It's not as it's, and it's probably not as if it, you know that's the only thing the man did in his career. I'm thinking he's pretty good for 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 a while. So, you know, but uh, to win two Super Bowls and be the Super Bowl MVP, I, I'm pretty sure that that's a uh, that's a that's a uh, Hall of Fame guy right there. Yep, got to wait for his brother to get in first. But yeah, I would imagine that both Mannings will be in. Can all right. Let's get into your wheelhouse then, Kevin. And uh, obviously, a big day for high school basketball today, including the uh, Jeff Coney Classic. And uh, the Jeff Coney Classic is after the deceased uh, Rancocas Valley coach. Uh, Rancocas with two gyms, too. So McGarry was describing this as the place to be today if you want to catch some great boys basketball. Tell us a little bit about the Classic and, and what, what the games are that are out there today. Yeah, you know, uh, this, is, this is the 13th year for it. And uh, Jay Flanagan, the coach at RV, does a real nice job of, of organizing this. And, uh, you know, what the thing is with this, too, is that Jay has gotten tremendous support. You know, like a lot of people do when they host showcase events, uh, a tremendous amount of support from not only the, the school staff and administration, but the community as well. So, you know, uh, I think <clears throat> everything is, is a, a volunteer basis. I don't think anybody's getting paid to do anything out there today. So all the money that comes through the gate um, will go towards uh, scholarship uh, for uh, a uh, RV senior, um, depending on how much money I guess is raised, it is, is depends on maybe if it's more than one scholarship. But um, as far as the basketball part of it is concerned, you know, um, it's a great day. It starts at 11 o'clock, games in both gyms going on uh, at the same time. And, uh, you know, uh, he sets this up pretty much, uh, it's almost set up almost a year in advance. So you, you, can't, um, you can't fault him for sometimes the matchups looking really really good uh you know when it when it first gets uh gets scheduled and settled and then things changing a little bit depending on what might happen to teams over the summertime and and, and so forth but um some really good games tonight today um i believe there's 12 games all together one will be a girls game between rv and cherokee uh cherokee girls are very very good um and uh then you know obviously the rest of the games are boys games uh the big game i think you know Heading into the tournament, the big game would be the the game at, at seven o'clock, seven fifteen or so, the last one of the night with Paul the Six and Trenton Catholic. So, uh, a, a good day of basketball. Um, a lot of top teams will be there. Wildwood Catholic will play today. Saint Augustine will play today. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of other teams up in up in the northern part of the South Jersey section will, will be there. So, a great day of basketball for a great cause. It always seems to run extremely smooth. And uh, you get an opportunity, you know, if you're a basketball junkie, to to kind of find yourself a spot and and go, uh, you know, even if you if you want to jump from gym to gym, that's great. Or find yourself a spot and just sit there all day and watch some some very good games. Yeah, twelve games, two gyms, like you said, starts at eleven o'clock, and a lot of feature games too. Let me ask you this question: since I I don't know, I think I'm think I've been to RV, but I'm not sure if I've been in the gym. Uh, well, <laughs> Just like the U.S. Open there in tennis has different courts or, you know, there's different feelings for the venue. What's the difference between the main gym and the back gym? Are, are sometimes the games more intense in the smaller back gym than the main gym? There's been times where the games in the back gym have been uh, extremely intense and, 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 uh, and very, very good. But I think, you know, the real difference is the back gym is the, is the original gym to the school. Um, the main gym is the gym that was, I think, you know, built later on. Uh, there's only seating on one side of the court in the back gym, but okay. there's plenty of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the main gym is kind of, I guess, you know, if, if you looked at it from, from his perspective last year, you know, making, organizing the event, the 
maybe the teams that were a little bit more higher profile, maybe the matchups that looked like they would probably be a little bit better are the ones in the main gym. But, uh, you know, like I said, that was a year ago. So, you know, there's going to be great games in both gyms. So uh, don't think that just because it says main gym makes it the, the quote-unquote main event because, uh, you know, there'll be games in that in that back gym that will be as entertaining and as intense as the other one. Sure. Back gym-wise, I sit there, I look at Glassboro and Atlantic City at 2, or Delcy Eastern is 1230, Morristown Seneca 515. These are some of the back gym games, Haddonfield and Highland at 645. You mentioned on the boys' side, Kevin, that the, probably the premier game, Paul the Sixth and Trenton Catholic tonight, uh, Jalen Boyd Savage uh, from Paul the Sixth, the real deal, Whistler Sannon, uh, and then the other names on the Trenton Catholic side, Jameer Watkins and Donovan Crawford. Yeah, you know, uh, going into the season and then, to this point, you know, Paul Six's uh, expectations were pretty good for this team. It's a team that's loaded with juniors. Uh, Jalen Boyd-Savage, Wisler San, and uh, Jordan Pierre, um, a, tra- a uh, international kid. Um, Nicolo no- Nobili from Italy is, is with them. So, And they're all juniors, and they're experienced players. So they're, they're a very talented team. And, you know, they were in the state rankings up until last week. And, uh, uh they're they're talented and they're they like to get up and down the floor and Trenton Catholic has been a team that uh, you know over the last say ten years or so has been a, a power in non public B. Um, you know going into the week I thought Jameer Watkins was going to be uh, you know obviously he's going to be a player to watch now I don't know if he's actually going to play today or not given the fact that he missed the last game for disciplinary reasons okay. so I don't know how I don't know what I don't know how that that came about but uh, he's a kid going to Virginia Commonwealth. And uh, if he's on the floor, obviously makes a big difference for them. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's some decent games. And I think that uh, if you go back to that other that game you mentioned with Morristown and Seneca, that's, a, that's an interesting game, too. Two group three teams, Morristown a defending state champion, Seneca a team that um, reached the South Jersey final against Delcy, I want to believe, at least two years ago now. Um, you know, that, that, could, that could be a very, very good game as well. So, like I said before, a lot of good games in, in both gyms. Now, I know, Kevin, you like to spread yourself around, see a lot of different teams, but my goodness, if you, if you didn't go check out Camden and Roselle Catholic, uh, they'd question your your uh, validity as the basketball guru, right? I mean, you, you had to go to that game, and, and not only that, uh, Camden uh, found a way to pull it off. Yeah, if you cover South Jersey High School basketball, uh, you know, you had to be in that gym. You know, that's that was the game of the day. Um, potentially one of the games of the week and of the season. And, uh, you know, Camden coming off of their, their huge win up at the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame in the Hoop Hall Classic over Rancho Christian from California, you know, they came into the week, they had to knock off uh, Woodrow Wilson first, which they, which they took care of business. But, you know, uh, Newman University over in Aston, PA, was a ver- really nice court, really nice facility. And, you know, you have two teams in the state going at it, and Camden just – jumped out from the very start and you know uh, like any good game and any good team you know you you, you kind of know the other team's going to make a run at some point and, and Roselle did make that run in the second quarter and put together an 8 18 and 180 uh, run to take the lead at halftime and you know all of a sudden uh, you know it was you know, it was a really it was a game and second half Camden just turned it up again and uh, I, you know is I've seen Camden now play several times and they are they are the real deal, and, uh, you know, if you're looking to watch what I think will ultimately be a team that will challenge for a tournament champion's um, crown, you know, you've got to see them play. Uh, there's depth to the team. Uh, there's extremely, ex- they're extremely talented from, you know, right on down the, down the lineup, and, and they, uh, they work, they share the ball, and they work well together, and they're extremely disciplined. Um you know, they have moments where, they, you know, they kind of get caught up in things like every team does. But, you know, for the most part, they uh, they have played as a team. There's no, you know, there's no guy that scores 30 a night, although one could easily do it. The fifth starter could easily do it. So they're a team to watch, and uh, they, they just poured it on in the second half against Roseau Catholic and really, really put a uh, – a beating on him, I, I, I guess you could say, in the second half to uh, to win that game. I think it was like 14 points. And, um, 
you know, you kind of uh, Mike Frankel had asked the question of of Lance Ware after the game towards the end of the of the interviews that basically, you know, did did you kind of make a statement for for, for South Jersey? Did you kind of put the state on notice that you know uh, Camden is here and and you know it doesn't matter whether it's north or south that the Camden is one of the best teams in the state and. And Lance Ware's reaction was that basically, you know, people should know that they've already been put on notice, and, and that that victory shouldn't have surprised a lot of a lot of people. But uh, you know, they're they're a team to watch. They're they're a fun team to watch, and uh, you know, I think big things are on the horizon for them. Good answer by him. A good answer, and like you said, a statement game. Now, now how come uh, Rick Brunson doesn't speak with the media? Well, what's the story there? Well, Pete, that's a you know that's a difficult question to ask. I mean, I'm to answer. Um, I've made attempts to find out. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've received the same answer over and over again. So I'm going to just leave it alone. But um, he just doesn't feel as though he needs to talk to the media. I think that there, um, in all honesty, I think there's probably some things uh, in his past that, you know, don't want to be brought up again. Okay. And uh, you know, and and his reaction to when I when I did uh, attempt. To, to get an answer uh, about a week or two ago was that it was about the kids. So, you know, it's frustrating from a writer's perspective sure. because you'd like to tell you'd like to tell stories of the kids and you'd like to tell stories of of the team and and what they're doing. And it's difficult to do when you can't get the perspective of the coach um, about his kids and the perspective of the coach about his team. And uh, there are only two seniors that are, are permitted even to talk to the media after games, mm. one being Lance Ware and another one being a senior who doesn't really see the floor all that much. And, you know, it's difficult to to write a story about X, Y, and Z when you cannot talk to X, Y, and Z. And to get the uh, the feelings of one kid about one about one teammate is, you know, it, it's difficult. So... From that perspective, uh, you know, as a from a writer's side of things, there's a whole lot more that could be done, but because we are limited in in the availability of people, it simply is not going to be done because it just doesn't make sense. So, I guess like I guess I uh, did I answer your question? Hundred percent. Maybe, maybe not. No, hundred percent. It's 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 just it's it's. I would just say, you know, in, in 30, some 32 years of covering high school sports, you know, from time to time you get a coach after a game who doesn't want to talk about it. It was a bad game. It's a bad day. Okay. And you kind of move on and, and you live with it. But this is, this is, kind of, this is like a new – this is new for, for me. You know, I, I, I've never had a high school coach basically say, I'm off limits for the entire season. So, you know, from that perspective, I, I hoped – and I still continue to hope that, that, that Rick Brunson maybe changes his policy and, and decides that maybe at some point to open up a little bit about the kids and about the team because there's a lot of great stories there, and I'm, think, and I'm, I'm sure people would love to, love to hear about them, but right now we're just not getting it. Yeah, no, I just found it interesting. I, I was reading your story, and it said in keeping with his season-long policy, Brunson did not speak with the media following the game, and that caught my attention. And, of course, you allude to his past, and I know he did have some trouble off the court and things like that. Maybe he doesn't want that dug up. But, you know, if his answer is it's about the kids, well, who better than to speak about the kids than the person leading them? I'm with you. I, I, I can only, I guess, hope that, you know, with a team this special or, or, or potentially as special as it could turn out to be, that maybe at some point he does change his mind. But we'll let that we'll let that go for now. I just it picked my you know caught my attention as I scrolled through your story, and I wanted to ask you about it. So yes, you you very much did answer that question. So you talked about the fact that you know Mike Frankel asked that question. Basically, did the South prove something to the North? And uh, you have uh, you also retweeted this week the twenty greatest boys programs of the decade, right? Uh, how did that break down, and how much fun was that to put together? That was a, you know, a, a, like I said before, and I've told you in the past, we do a lot of collaborative things. So uh, Rich Greco and Mike Kinney and myself, you know, we, we got together and we, you know, it, it took a little bit of work to go back and and find out where the uh, where these teams landed in, in top 20s at the end of the year and, and go back and dig up, uh, you know, uh, state championships and, and tournament champions runs and, you know, how far they got in certain 
aspects of the season. And, um, you know, it's uh, it, it took a little bit of time, a little bit of work, because, um, you know, obviously there's no exact science to putting this together. Um, you know, there's people that will, will look at it and, and they say, you know, why is – why is this team not in and why is that team there and they should be higher and they should be lower. And um, so it was a, you know, it was a bit of work. I think, um, you know, for the most part, there were no brainers. And uh, when you look at the accomplishments of certain teams and what they've done over the past 10 years, it was, it was more than obvious that they belonged. And and in a lot of cases, more than obvious uh, in what order they belong. St. Anthony, obviously, you know, was, was a no brainer, you know, Bob Hurley and the, the legendary, you know, Hall of Fame coach, even in, even with the school shutting down with, I believe it was two years left in the decade, was so dominant for its time there and, and had, had won so many titles and, and top top five finishes for that matter that, you know, they were clearly the, the best team in the, in, in, the, in the state during the last decade. And then you got other, you know, other aspects of it and people – People had asked, you know, why, where, where, where was a Haddonfield? You know, a Haddonfield that had dominated the Colonial Conference and and dominated, uh, you know, Group Two the last couple of years. And you know, where was Camden, a team that had reached five straight state finals? And I think one of the big things that we looked at when we put the list together was, um, you know, the Tournament of Champions was a was a, a factor in it. You know, a state championship was a factor in it. Um, you know, uh, while there's not while they don't play a lot of um, specialized tournaments down in the south part of the state. They do a lot of county championships up north where, especially in, in like Union County, where you get four or five of these elite teams playing in this tournament year in and year out. So, you know, there are a lot of factors went into it and in, uh, in determining exactly where they fell. And, you know, South Jersey had three representatives uh, in St. Augustine with, with two, uh, two state championships and, um, Atlantic City with a couple state championships, uh, Camden Catholic with a, a tournament of champions title and a couple of state titles. So, uh, you know, it, it's difficult for the South when you look at what the teams up North did. And it was, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, a lot of people also wanted to know, well, why didn't you break it down into publics and privates? And, you know, I think once you start doing that and, and I understand the reasoning, um, you start watering it down. So as long as the state, you know, as long as those those teams, you know, those those non-public teams are following the state guidelines and the state rules, and and that's just the way it is. Well, then we're not going to water it down, you know, and and leave that open for discussion. You know, uh, is there an advantage for non-public schools? Absolutely, they can get who they want. Kids can come from all over. We understand that. We get that. But they play under the same umbrella, you know, as everyone else. So you have to include them as the same as the, as the public schools and, you know, in basketball, they're, you know, let's be honest, they're, they're just a little bit better. So, uh, you know, every year here and there, you get a public school that uh, will rise to the occasion and, and make a dent and maybe, maybe finish number one. It hasn't happened in a long time, but uh, you know, it was, like I said, it was an interesting thing to do to kind of go back and, and see how these teams had done over the past decade and, and uh, kind of put that list together. 